Thank you. Um, so let me get my presentation up and put it on slideshow. Um, so thank you for having me. Like I said, um, I teach at Aquilani's High School in Lafayette, California. And to give you a little bit of context as to how uh, Avery even like knew to reach out to me, I created this website called apushlights.com. Very similar to what Tom does on YouTube is I just started putting my lectures up on uh, YouTube when distance learning started. I had always wanted to change my classroom into uh, a flipped classroom from the moment that I started teaching 11 years ago, because that was like the new big thing that uh, we were studying in education school. And I saw COVID as the uh, opportunity to, to do so. And so I put all my lectures up there and then everything that we did in the classroom was just go through primary source documents and uh, analyze them in the way that they would have to analyze them on the AP exam. And uh, when I started working with Avery, uh, all I did was really just put all of the primary source documents that I was using in class already into Class Companion. And then when she launched, now I'm able to do so even without having to go through her and uh, having her put up there. So my experience with Class Companion has been mostly to use the, the primary source questions. And um, the reason why I like it is because I'm able to add more documents uh, that are specific to the topics that I want to emphasize. And also there are documents that sometimes aren't even mentioned in some of the uh, AP textbooks, like I'll show you in a second. Uh, I like that they, students get instant feedback on whether or not they comprehend what the document is saying. And this is one of the things that I found shocking when I first started using Class Companion, because for three years, uh, up until the point that I started using it, we were just going through these documents in class and kids, and I'm sure you're aware, will sometimes just smile and nod and, and make it seem like they understand when in reality, they were just had some completely crazy, weird understanding of the document. And Class Companion was able to instantly tell them like, no, this is what this is about. And uh, it also gave them a chance to uh, reform their, their thinking about it. I like that it encourages students to expand on their answers. And now I feel like I can use class time for even deeper analysis. If I assign these primary sources outside of class, all they have to do is make sure that they understand what the document is saying. And then we can make even greater connections when we're doing that, this in class. And so here's an example of one of the documents that I've just recently added into Class Companion. And I got this document from one of the Gilder Lerman Institute of American History's self-paced courses. Uh, the course is called Black Lives in the Founding Era. And it's a document written by Lemuel Haynes, and he was a Revolutionary War veteran. He was Black. He was a poet. He was the first Black man to be ordained as a minister in the United States, and he is considered the first Black abolitionist. He writes this petition uh, quoting the Declaration of Independence, and when I first went through this self-paced course, I was shocked. I was like, I've never heard of this person. He's never been in any of the AP textbooks that I've taught, and so uh, now I'm able to, I guess, uh, add or include people who should be in the historical record uh, and make them make my students aware of all these different voices. And so I just uploaded the document and I created some AP style questions. And the examples that the uh, feedback that the class companion gives, uh, I think are, are really good because they, they are promoting the student to continue to their thinking or to continue to expand on their response. So as you can see here, this examples responding to describe one possible event that may have led to the creation of this document. And it's a, just one short uh, sentence response that does talk about something that is related to the, the answer to the question, the Enlightenment principles uh, going on around at the late 18th century. But it, it's not quite enough in the level of detail that it needs to provide. And so Class Companion usually starts with, you're on the right track consider expanding your answer in these various different ways. And it does the same thing here for the second response. Uh, uh, here's an example of one that it did award a correct answer. And uh, once it has uh, awarded the points, and it says, great job, it's got positive reinforcement, and it also continues to expand, and it gives them more information about what they could have included in their response to make it even better. So I, I love this feature about it, that it continues to get the students to think about other ways in which the answer could have been correct, not just the way that they came up with. Uh, and then the other thing that I was gonna talk about today is AI 
image generators. When I talked to Peter, he had never uh, used any of these before, and I had just barely started dabbling into them. Uh, the first one that I'll talk about is called Midjourney. You can go to midjourney.com, sign up for an account. The subscription is about $10 a month, and it operates through a Discord server. So Discord is like this, um, I don't know how to even describe it, like a, a chat room, uh, a, a, a message board, uh, and it has various different servers for specific interests. So this is how Midjourney operates. You go to one of their message boards, you type in a command, and it will create a image based on what you had asked for it. And then there's also DALI, which is part of the OpenAI project. DALI is free to start, uh, but after you use some of your commands, you'll have to uh, pay more money for some more tokens. And I'm going to give you examples of the types of images that you can create out of these two. So here is uh, wow. John F. Kennedy. Uh, and I, I just told Midjourney to say, uh, to give me an image of John F. Kennedy in the style of a comic book uh, at Rice University while he's giving his uh, going to the moon speech. Uh, then I told it to give a picture of a 1920s uh, Model T at a warehouse, also in the style of a comic book. And then some Revolutionary War soldiers with American flag in the background. Sometimes you can be very specific about what you want, and usually you'll get uh, something that's more similar to what you're envisioning. Sometimes you can be a little bit more vague, and then Midjourney will give you a variety of different options of things that you could choose from. So whenever you get into Midjourney and you go to Discord, then you'll type in your commands in two of the following areas. So you can find the newbies or the general servers. And in those, you'll be able to see all of the commands that are going on in the server. So everyone, uh, everything that people are wanting to generate, you'll see pop up. And it's like a constant feed of various different images. So your own commands can actually get lost through the constant updating of the page. So the way that I like to do it is to go through direct message. You go into your private messages, you go to the bot, and all of your commands end up in one place, and you only see your own images. And sometimes if you're asking kids to do this on their own, this is probably the safest way because then you can't control what they're going to be exposed to in those other new, uh, servers. They'll only be able to see what they are wanting to generate. So with Midjourney, uh, you ask to uh, generate an image with uh, forward slash imagine, and then you type in the prompt. And then at the end of the prompt, you're going to tell it the aspect ratio that you want the image to be produced. So all of the images that I just showed you, their aspect ratio of 8 to 10. And uh, the default aspect ratio is 1 to 1. So if you're OK to 1 to 1, then you don't have to type that in at the end. All right, so here is another example. Uh, I asked it to give me a vector drawing of a black soldier during the Civil War with an aspect ratio of 16, 9, and then it gives you four different options to choose from. So you can see there's a variety of different styles of characters, one's in color, three are in black and white, and then uh, you have to say, okay, I like number three or I like number two, can you give me different variations or can you just give me the full size file of it? So they're numbered in a uh, uh, in the direction of one, two at the top, and then three, four at the bottom. So I said, I really like number three. Can you give me the, the bigger file for number three? There'll be a button that's titled U3, and you'll click on that, and then it gets you the, oh, the full-size image. Wow. Yeah, really. So that that's amazing, yeah. Bruno. Um, I, I hear... Um, graphic artists all over the country now just losing their lunch and yes. <laughs> wondering and that, what that, they're going to do in their next career. And, and that's something that, that I'll talk about in the considerations of things that, you know, are still need mm -hmm. to be fixed with this and, and room for improvement and maybe a responsible use for this as well. Um, now, the, the Dolly project, uh, I don't use quite as much. So here's a prompt that I typed into Dolly. You just tell it exactly what you want. There's no need to have a, a specific nomenclature for the beginning or the end. So I said, Willem Howard Taft, stuck in a bathtub, drawn and colored in the style of Dr. Seuss with a simple color palette. Uh, usually, whenever you give the AI a very specific command, it will be more likely to give you exactly what you're thinking of. That's especially true when you're using the chat function. 
but Stali is, is not quite up to the level of, of mid journey. So these are, are the various different options that they gave me to choose from. Now, if I gave this same exact uh, prompt to mid journey, then uh, this is what it provides. So definitely something that looks more similar to what I was asking it to do. But as you can see, there are some odd things that the AI decides to add. So for example, in number one, he's taking a bath with some weird looking cat squirrel creature. <laughs> and in images number three and four, it decides that, you know, this is a good place to add some birds some ducks and some pigeon looking things. And uh, in, in number four, he's actually seems to be holding the faucet of, of the tub. So uh, it tries to make its best guess as to what this might look like. And sometimes its best guess is not exactly what how human life actually works. Um, so say that I like one of these and I want to see a slight variation. You'll also see a button next to the U buttons that's titled a V button. And so the variation of one, two, three, or four, I will ask it to give me a variation of image number three. So V3, I'll just click on that. And now you see that it's given me four different options with Taft having four different facial expressions and being surrounded by different backgrounds. And again, you can see that it does its very best, but it still can produce some errors. In the fourth image down here, you can see that this bird seems to have two beaks. Hmm. It almost, and, almost looks like he's in the snow too, instead yeah. of in a bathtub or a mm -hmm. lake anymore. And so you could go crazy with this. You could keep asking for variations upon variations upon variations until you get exactly what you're envisioning. Or uh, as you'll see later, you can also give it source images to create its next image. And so very simply here, I just said, I like version number three or version number one. Can you give me the, the bigger file of this? And this is what it, it shot out. Okay, so how to use this or integrate this into the social studies classroom? There's various activities that I've tried to come up with in which I either get students to um, use an AI image generator and then write some text alongside with it, or there's also things that I can use as a teacher to introduce new, maybe more complex um, topics using the images in a more approachable way. So the first one of these is my spirit animal activity. <laughs> So I give students a list of spirit animals and the things that they represent and the different values and uh, things that are attributed to them and also a list of historical figures. So this is Franklin and his spirit animal, the owl. And so uh, this is just actually a, a sample that I wrote to give to students so that they can see like, what am I supposed to be doing? And the owl here represents wisdom, intuition, the ability to see through illusions. And I ask students that you have to make the connection, not just saying like, well, they're both wise or they're both smart or they both can see, but actually use pieces of evidence that are going to work those historical muscles. Uh, the historical thinking skill that we're going for here is uh, comparison, right? To be able to bring two different things and, and make those connections as to really how is it that, you know, why is it that the Benjamin Franklin is seen as wise or has good intuition? And so you'd have to look at various different parts of his life that, that would show that. And the second activity here, we were going back to Taft in the tub. Uh, I thought that it would be a really fun way to introduce uh, new topics or new units using children's books. So that, that was the whole reason for this uh, Dr. Seuss style image. And so I asked the mid-journey uh, AI to give me this image. And then I also asked, uh, oh, sorry, uh, chat GPT to give me a uh, st student or a, a kid's storybook uh, story on Taft in the tub that also rhymes. And you can see here some of the uh, some of the text that it produced. It's a much longer uh, <laughs> poem. It ended up being about 30 stanzas. And it does a really good job of in introducing some of the evidence and uh, some of the actions that Taft did during his time as president, whether it be conservation or trust busting. And it kind of ties it all together with this incident or apocryphal story of him getting stuck in the bathtub, which of course he actually did not. 
And then finally, at the end of the year, something that I like to do is uh, to create coloring books. Uh, I used to have this really big coloring book uh, of American history book, and uh, you know, I'd make copies of the different pages for the students, but now I, I can actually produce those pages using mid-journey. So here's what I, I told to produce a George Washington page uh, uh, coloring book, and it decided to add flowers on the border, and I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. So in the next uh, mid-journey prompt that I gave it, I said, I want Frederick Douglass, and I also want him to have a border of flowers. Uh, like I said, uh, oh, so now here's some, some considerations. Uh, it can't produce words. Uh, whenever you ask it to uh, give me a protest photo of suffragettes holding a sign uh, to get the right to vote, this is the best that it can do. It gives something that looks like letters in a grouping that makes it look like words. And when I was showing it to another teacher in, in my school, he actually said, you know what, this kick in itself be it, its own lesson activity. You could give this to the students and you could tell the students, write a caption or write the message that this poster should have. Given all the context around it, that there's women that are dressed in 1920 style clothing, they're outside of the Capitol, what is it do you think that they're protesting or what is it you think that they want? Uh, another consideration here is that it has difficulty with eyes and hands. You can see the woman in the front of this image seems to have about 20 collective fingers and the pupils in the eyes are always in a spare in hand. It looks different like. ways. Yes. <laughs> um, so again, it's doing its very best, but it, hands and eyes are something that it has difficulty with, especially whenever there's a large scene uh, behind the character. If you were to try and get the, per the AI to just generate one single image or one single person, then it might do a better job. Uh, and the last thing here is that there's a lot of trial and error. I uh, was trying to get Midjourney to create a coloring book page of Alice Paul, and it, it just didn't know what Alice Paul looked like. There's a function in which you can give the AI a source image and have it produce it based on that. But even after giving the source image, Midjourney thought that Alice Paul was some sort of fairy princess with a magical kingdom behind her, uh, which this kind of gets to the next problem is that the way that the uh, Midjourney uh, image generator portrays female subjects can be problematic at times. So here is me giving it a uh, prompt to recreate Angela Davis as a coloring book page. And for reference, this is what Angela Davis looked like in the 1970s. And then this is what oh, the AI generator gave. So something that doesn't look like Angela Davis, something that is maybe more hypersexualized and something that probably takes away some of her, you know, black facial features away and it makes them less prominent. So I say all those things because th there's this technology still growing and there still really needs to be a lot of thought in the user or from the user to use it responsibly so that we are not continuing to promote these hypersexualized images of females. Uh, you know, the AI's source of knowledge is everything that has already been produced and everything that's on the internet. And the male bias and the hypersexualization of women that has occurred and is present up until this time in history it is a part of that. And so we need to make sure that whenever we are using it to create these images, that we recognize those biases so that we don't continue to pass them on to our students. Uh, and so finally, for the best practices, uh, I think that AI tools are great for formative assessments and formative activities and extra practice. Everything that Avery said, uh, if we we're gonna use this for uh, summative assessments, I think the technology needs to get a little bit better because at this point, if we're concerned about cheating, then handwritten in class assessments are still the best solution for those types of uh, assessments. Or if we're going to do it in class, then we can also use lockdown browsers. And that is all that I have. I'm happy to take questions or uh, take questions at the end. Wow. Thank you, Bruno. Mm -hmm. That's uh, amazing stuff. I had no idea it was that far advanced. Uh, I have a kid who wants to study animation. Maybe I should save myself the $58,000 a year she wants to spend on art school 
and just have her use uh, Scribble Diffusion or any of the myriad AI engines that do this wonderful rendering. It's uh, spooky and scary. So, um, and I, I do want to kind of acknowledge that you hit on using this to help students make connections between historical figures and historical eras. That's mm -hmm. typically one of our weak spots with students. Um, they really suffer, they really struggle to get those connection questions, get those connection points on the exam. So thank you for sharing. Thank you.